Hello, this is a lecture on the scientists who helped discover the gas laws that we're studying in the chapter called Gas Laws, and closely related, the chapter on states of matter. We begin with Robert Boyle. Between the slides that I read from, I have pictures that I will discuss that will help reinforce the ideas behind the gas laws. Take notes, copious notes, use them on your test. There will be questions regarding these slides on your test. And you may submit notes from this lecture for extra credit. We begin with Robert Boyle, who is considered by many the founder of modern chemistry. And I certainly hope that that is a wig he is wearing, Robert Boyle. This is Boyle's Law. It's a, kind of a picture of Boyle's Law, and it simply says that on the left and on the right, the pressure is the same. It's 300. Now, on the left, you have a cylinder, and on the right, you have a cylinder. As I reduce the, the volume, I'm going, to, I'm going to press the piston down. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to have the volume, and in order to do so, I must be doubling the pressure. I'm going to keep the uh, slides at 60 seconds each and I will be able to read all of them in with, within that period of time. If I finish early I will discuss either this slide or the law that I'm reading from and uh, good luck. Robert Boyle was born in 16 27 and died in 1691. He was born at Lismore Castle in Munster, Ireland, the 14th child of the Earl of Cork. As a young man of means, he was tutored at home and on the continent. He spent the later years of the English Civil War at Oxford, reading and experimenting with his assistants and colleagues. This group was committed to the new philosophy which valued observation and experiment at least as much as logical thinking in formulating accurate scientific understanding. At the time of the restoration of the British monarchy in 1660, Boyle played a key role in the founding of the Royal Society to nurture this new view of science. There's a lot here. There's an amazing amount here. This new philosophy is something that caught on like wildfire in this very late high renaissance period and uh, propelled many scientists into the new thinking. Benjamin Franklin was a, part, was a product of this. So were many of the founding fathers of the United States. Here, here is another example of Boyle's Law. You can see that I have a pressure of two units and I double the pressure. And as a result of doubling the pressure, I am going to have the volume. Now, very important, the, the, the experiment is done at room temperature. So the left and right are under the same temperature. Now, if I'm increasing the pressure of the piston on the right, why wouldn't it get warmer? Well, any heat produced is allowed to bleed out of the system. This is not adiabatic. It's not insulated. So temperature is allowed to remain constant uh, between the left and the right cylinder. So it's not going to be a problem. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the timings of any of the uh, diagrams to 30 seconds to reduce the amount of time that you actually have to listen to this. At this time, even the idea of an experiment was controversial. The established method of discovering something was to argue it out using the established logical rules Aristotle and others had worked out 2,000 years ago. Boyle was more interested in observing nature and drawing his conclusions from what actually happened. He was the first prominent scientist to perform controlled experiments and publish his work with details concerning procedure, apparatus, and observation. He began to publish in 1659 and continued to do so for the rest of his life on subjects as diverse as philosophy, medicine, and religion. 
This, uh, when you write up a lab report, you can essentially thank Robert Boyle, the father of chemistry. Uh, you've had arguments with your friends, and your friends have said, you know, they want to um, get to the truth. Well, the truth is a matter of opinion. It's facts and those that are measurable that is important in science. Here is a curve of pressure versus volume. As I increase the volume going from left to right, I am, uh, I am uh, decreasing the pressure. This is uh, true for the reverse. As I increase the pressure, the volume is decreasing. Or as I decrease the volume, the pressure is increasing. Also, this also says, obviously, and we'll say it on the next slide, that the pressure and volume, the relationship is indirect. The volume is inversely proportionate to the pressure. It is Boyle's law for which he remains most famous. This states that if the volume of a gas is decreased, the pressure increases inversely proportionately. That's a mouthful. Understanding that his results could be explained if all gases were made of tiny particles. Boyle tried to construct a universal corpuscular theory of chemistry. He defined the modern idea of an element as well as introducing the litmus test to tell acids from bases and introduced many other standard chemical tests. In 1660, together with 11 others, Boyle formed the Royal Society in London, which met to witness elements and discuss what we now call scientific concepts. You can see that this is the basis from which many of the scientists develop things like the particle and kinetic theory of gases, the elasticity of collisions, etc. Here's another graphical representation of Boyle's law, volume versus pressure. Uh, it's very basic. It's a unique uh, equation. It's y equals 1 over x. So, and you can see that the, the um, you can see that in the last slide that the, uh, the pressure can also be for a fluid is dependent upon the depth of the liquid. Or I should say the depth of the fluid. In 1668, Boyle moved permanently to London, living with his sister. In 1680, he refused the presidency of the Royal Society because the oath required violated his strongly held religious principles. Boyle died in London on the 31st of December, 1691. Here's another uh, representation. It's the same thing. It's this parabolic, hyperbolic curve. Uh, y equals 1 over x. For Boyle's law, it says if gas is held at a constant temperature, the volume is inversely proportionate to the pressure. Compressing a gas to half its volume doubles the pressure. And the next law we're going to do is Charles's law. And Charles's law says if a gas is held constant pressure, constant pressure, the volume is directly proportionate to the absolute temperature in Kelvin. It must be in Kelvin. Heating a gas to double its original temperature doubles its volume. And there's a uh, there's a graph that shows it. It's a straight line, and the slope of that line is a constant. The slope of that line is a constant. And here's a picture of Jacques Alexandre César Charles. He was French. He was French. His work was actually published by um, Gay Lussac. We'll see later. Here's a um, here's a pressure gauge. The pressure gauge is constant, and you see that. As I'm heating, the, as the thermometer is rising, you see the data, and the data is going to, if you graph the data, it's going to be proportionate to uh, the temperature. The volume will, be, will increase proportionally. Uh, Jacques André Charles, uh, Jacques André César Charles was a mathematician and physicist, remembered for his pioneering work with gases and hydrogen balloon flights. Charles was born on November 12th, 1746 in Bugeny, Bugency, 
Loray, France. His first occupation was as a clerk at the Ministry of Finance in Paris. However, his interests eventually turned to science. In the late 1700s, ballooning became a major, major, major preoccupation in France and other industrialized nations. In early June 1783, the Montgolfier brothers launched the first successful hot balloon in Paris. Charles, who was interested in aeronautics, understood, it'll go to the next slide, just remember, Charles, who was interested in aeronautics, understood the concept of buoyancy and also was aware of Henry Cavendish's discovery of hydrogen. Henry Cavendish discovered hydrogen, an element some 14 times lighter than air, 17 years earlier. 14 times lighter, and it was discovered 17 years earlier, on August 27, 1783. Charles launched the first hydrogen-filled balloon using gas produced by the reaction of sulfuric acid on iron filings. Among the 50,000 witnesses of this event was Benjamin Franklin, then residing in Paris as the U.S. ambassador to France. When the, ballooning, when the balloon returned to Earth, in the French countryside, it was reportedly attacked with axes and pitchforks by terrified peasants who believed it to be a monster from the skies. Here is a great example of, of heating. I have, uh, at the left, I have 250 degrees Celsius. On the right, I have negative 65 degrees Celsius. And I am reducing the volume by reducing the temperature. Now remember, that's not Kelvin. That's uh, that's uh, degrees Celsius. It's proportional to degrees to. It's proportional to the change in volume is proportional to Kelvin. On November twenty first of that same year, the Montgolfier brothers launched the first hot air balloon with humans aboard, managing an altitude of less than thirty meters, ninety eight feet. Charles, with the aid of brothers Nicholas and Anjan Robert became the first human to ascend in a hydrogen balloon just 10 days later, a far greater height of almost 3,000 meters, 9,843 feet, was attained thanks to the superior lift of the hydrogen balloon Charles had designed and helped build. Charles is best known for his studies on how the volume of gases changes with temperature. As you increase the temperature, you increase the volume. And there's a perfect graph that illustrates that. Notice that that is in Kelvin. Not degrees Kelvin, because it's absolute scale. It's simply Kelvin. So as I'm increasing the temperature, I am increasing the volume proportionally. So volume is proportionate to change in temperature in terms of Kelvin. The English, phys the English scientist Robert Boyle had many years earlier determined the inverse relationship between volume and pressure of a gas when temperature T is held constant. In 1662, he published the results that would later become known as Boyle's Law, where volume is inversely proportionate to pressure at constant T. That is a... A, a law that now exists as Boyle's Law, and Charles was cognizant of that his whole life, and the next slide will show the mathematical rep representation of Charles's Law. Now remember, Charles's Law says that volume is proportional to T with at constant P. So that will be Charles's Law. This is Boyle's Law. It's in the Charles chapter because it's, it's, uh, it helped Charles understand the relationship between volume and temperature. Absolute zero, straight line, and it's going to be uh, a proportional relationship between volume and temperature. Now remember, the change in volume is proportional to degrees Kelvin. During the winter of 1787, Charles studied oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and carbon dioxide, and found that the volume of all these gases increased identically with higher temperature when pressure was held constant. 
And his law is, reads, volume is proportional to temperature at constant P. That's the reading of that uh, expression. So let me say it again. The increase in volume is proportional to temperature in Kelvin, not in Celsius. The volume is proportional to temperature in Kelvin. So you have to convert from Celsius to Kelvin. Now, Charles went on to study other things relative to gases. Here's another example, another illustration that illustrates Charles's law. I increase the, the temperature, I will increase the volume. The, the slope, the y over x, the change in y over the change in x is the same at both points. Charles did not publish the results of his work at the time, but another French scientist, Joseph Louis Gay-Lussac, eventually learned of them. When Gay-Lussac did more extensive, more extensive and precise experiments and published his similar findings in 1802, as did the English scientist John Dalton, he acknowledged Charles's work, his original work. Thus, the law governing the thermal expansion of gases, although sometimes called Gay-Lussac's law, is more commonly known as Charles's law. Uh, v over T, 1, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So uh, that's Charles's law. And it's a quotient constant, which says that the slope of the line is linear. And here's, uh, here's another example of how the pressure is constant. You're doing it in a laboratory and you have constant, uh, constant pressure. And as I decrease the temperature, I decrease the volume proportionally as long as the temperature is in Kelvin. While most of Charles's papers were on mathematics, he was ultimately an avid scientist and inventor. He duplicated a number of experiments that Franklin and others had completed on electricity and designed several instruments, including a new type of hydrometer for measuring densities and a reflecting goniometer for measuring the angles of crystals, which we looked at in the previous chapter. Charles was elected to France's Academy of Scientists of Sciences in 1785 and later became professor of physics at the Conservatoire des Arts L. Metters. He died in Paris on April 7th, 1823. My French students, please forgive my terrible pronunciation of the French terms. And here is a uh, can. I'm reducing the pressure. I'm reducing the. I'm reducing the temperature. I'm reducing the volume. This is Charles's law, and you can see how that atmospheric pressure was was the same beginning and end. Is just crushing the can. Uh, here is a picture of Joseph Louis Louis Gay Lussac. And we know him for Gay-Lussac's law, which says that as I, as I increase the pressure three times, I increase the temperature uh, three times, that the pressure changes proportionally with temperature. Pressure changes proportionally with temperature. Gay-Lussac was the eldest son of the provincial lawyer and royal official who lost his position with the French Revolution in 1789. His father sent him to a boarding school in Paris to prepare him to study law. Early in his schooling, Gay-Lussac acquired an interest in science, and his mathematical ability enabled him to pass the entrance exam for the newly founded École Polytechnique, where students' expenses were paid by the state. Although the school was designed primarily to train engineers, chemistry formed an important part of the curriculum. Gay-Lussac proved to be an exemplary student. During his studies there from 17, 
1897 to 1800. Upon graduation, he entered the prestigious School of Bridges and Highways. And here is a great example of pressure changes uh, where I have an increased temperature, that's a Bunsen burner, and I have pressure changes as a result of that. And the pressure changes are proportional to the change in temperature. He withdrew from this school in 1801 to become chemist Claude Louis Bertoli's research assistant. Bertoli, who had recently set up a laboratory in his country house at Arcule, just outside Paris, became the focus of a small but very influential private scientific society. The society's first volume of memoirs, published in 1807, included contributions from Gay-Lussac. At Arcule, Bertolle was joined by the eminent mathematician Pierre Simon Laplace, who engaged Gay-Lussac in experiments on capillarity in order to study short-range forces. Gay-Lussac's first publication, 1802, however, was on the thermal expansion of gases. To ensure more accurate experimental results, oops, it changed, I have to change the timing. Hold on. I was almost finished, sorry about that. To ensure more accurate experimental results, he used dry gases and pure mercury. Very interesting. And here is an expression which we use in class that helps us calculate uh, problems involving Gay-Lussac's law. And it shows that the initial pressure and the initial temperature, 1, equals the final pressure, 2, and temperature, 2, of the closed system. To continue, he concluded from his experiments that all gases expand equally over the temperature range of 0 to 100 degrees Celsius. This law, usually and mistakenly attributed to the French physicist Charles as Charles's law, was the first of several regularities in the behavior of matter that Gay-Lussac established. He later wrote, if one were not animated with the desire to discover laws, they would often escape the most enlightened attention. Of the laws Gay-Lussac discovered, he remains most best known for his law of the combining volumes of gases, 1808. He had previously, 1805, established that hydrogen and oxygen combine by volume in a ratio of 2 to 1. Now, that's significant because it's volumetric. It's a volumetric ratio of 2 to 1 to form water. That will become important later on when we talk about how other experiments were performed relative to volumetric. Volumetric is not the only way to go. It's important to know that hydrogen and oxygen uh, combined to, in a ratio of 2 to 1 respectively. So here is, uh, is Gay-Lussac's law, which says that I increase the pressure, I increase the temperature, and I do, they do it proportionally to one another. Now, to continue. Later experiments with boron trifluoride and ammonia produced spectacularly dense fumes and led him to investigate similar reactions, such as that between hydrogen chloride and ammonia, which combine in equal volumes to form ammonium chloride. Further study enabled him to generalize about the behavior of all gases. Gay-Lussac's approach to the study of matter was consistently volumetric rather than gravimetric. That's important. Look that up. First person that gives me the difference will get extra credit. In contrast to that of his English contemporary, John Dalton. So you may ask yourself, what is the difference? Well, look it up again. First person to do that and tell me will get some extra credit. What is volumetric versus gravimetric in terms of the approach to study of matter? Okay, 
Now, here is volume is constant. So you put a can of beans on a stove and you turn an unopened can of beans on the stove and you turn up the temperature. It's a closed volume. It's a, it's a constant volume. What's going to happen eventually to the can of beans? It's going to be all over the wall and you're going to be scraping beans off the wall for a month. Another example of Gay-Lussac's fondness for volumetric ratios appeared in an 1810 investigation into the composition of vegetable substances performed with his friend, Louis-Jacques Tenard. Together, they identified a class of substances, you may have heard of them, carbohydrates, including sugar and starch, that contained hydrogen and oxygen in the ratio of 2 to 1. They announced their results in the form of three laws according to the proportion of hydrogen and oxygen contained in the substances. I'm going to take a break. You'll never know I was gone. All right, here is a diagram that shows the enthalpy of a system. Enthalpy is not heat. It is the internal energy of a system. When we talk about the conservation of energy, elastic collisions, etc., we're talking about internal energy. And when a liquid transits, transitions to a gas, then to a, or, uh, or a liquid to a solid, or a solid to a liquid, etc., they go through the obvious transitions. But the point of the slide is that their enthalpy increases, their internal energy. And when we study gas laws, we're studying the internal energy. We're assuming that energy is not lost to the system that we're talking about, that the internal energy is either increased or decreased. As a young man, Gay-Lussac participated in dangerous exploits for scientific purposes. In 1804, he ascended in a hydrogen balloon with Jean-Baptiste Biot, in order to investigate the Earth's magnetic field at high altitudes and to study the composition of the atmosphere. They reached an altitude of 4,000 meters, about 13,000 feet. In a following solo flight, solo flight Gay-Lussac reached 7,000 meters, more than 23,000 feet, thereby setting a record for the highest balloon flight that remained unbroken for a half a century. In 1805 and 1806, amid the Napoleonic Wars, Gay-Lussac embarked upon a European tour with another archaeal colleague, the Prussian explorer Alexander von Humboldt. The next scientist we're going to do is familiar to many chemistry students or those who study chemistry and science, Amadeo Avogadro. If you're familiar with the mole, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles, the mass of a mole in grams is equivalent to the mass of one gram in atomic mass units. Sodium, one mole of sodium is 23 grams because the mass of one particle of sodium is 23 atomic mass units. Now, he, here we have, and he's, he worked with mole ratios. It says, in a reaction, two moles plus one mole of oxygen, two moles of hydrogen, plus one mole of oxygen yields two moles of water. So he's the guy who comes up with the constant ratios of, of chemicals that react chemically. Amadeo Avogadro, born August 9, 1776, in Turin, in the kingdom of Sardinia and Piedmont, Italy, died July 9, 1856, in Turin, Italian mathemat mathematical physicist who showed in what became known as Avogadro's Law that under controlled conditions of temperature, at constant temperature and pressure. Equal volumes of gases contain an equal number of molecules. Avogadro was the son of Filippo Avogadro, Count de, de Guarena, a Coreto.
a distinguished lawyer and senator in the Piedmont region of northern Italy. Avogadro graduated in jurisprudence in 1792, but did not practice law until after receiving his doctoral. Let me change the timing. Receiving his doctorate <coughs> in ecclesi ecclesiastical law four years later. In 1801, he became secretary to the prefecture of Arid Aridano. Excuse me for my Italian pronunciation. Here's Avogadro's law with constant temperature and pressure. The volume is proportional to the number of particles. Volume is proportional to moles. So the initial volume and the initial moles is equal to the final volume and final moles. Beginning in 1800, Avogadro privately pursued studies in mathematics and physics, and he focused his early research on electricity. In 1804, he became a corresponding member of the Academy of Sciences of Turin, and in 1806, he was appointed to the position of demonstrator at the Academy's college. Three years later, he became professor of natural philosophy at the Royal College of Vercelli, a post he held until 1820 when he accepted the first chair of mathematical physis physics at the University of Turin. Avogadro is chiefly remembered for his molecular hypothesis, first stated in 1811, in which he claimed that equal volumes of all gases at the same temperature and pressure contain the same number of molecules. Here's an example. Uh, one mole of oxygen, one mole of helium, one mole of uh, fluorine, one mole of argon. They have different masses, 32 grams, 4 grams, 38 grams, etc. But, but they all have the same volume, 22.4. So one mole of any gas at STP has a volume of 22.4 liters. He used this hypothesis further to explain the French chemist Joseph Louis Gay Lussac's law of combining volumes of gases, 1808, by assuming that the fundamental units of elementary gases may actually divide during chemical reactions. It also allowed for the calculation of the molecular weights of gases relative to some chosen standard. Avogadro and his contemporaries typically used the density of hydrogen gas as the standard for comparison. Thus, the following relationship was shown to exist. Weight of one volume of gas or vapor divided by the weight of one volume of hydrogen equals the weight of one molecule of gas or vapor divided by the weight of one molecule of hydrogen. You can see that around the early 1800s, there, were, there was a lot of experimentation on gases. Within 100 to 120 years of the death of Robert Boyle, the founder of modern chemistry, you had Avogadro, you had Gay-Lussac, you had Charles doing research that furthered his research on the understanding of gases and their behavior with, with temperature and pressure and the number of gas particles present. To distinguish between atoms and molecules of different kinds, Avogadro adopted terms including the molecule of a compound, the molecule of an element, and the word atom. Although his gaseous elementary molecules were predominantly diatomic, he also recognized the existence of monoatomic, triatomic, tetraatomic elementary molecules. In 1811, he proved the correct formula for water, nitric and nitrous oxides, ammonia, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen chloride. Three years later, he described the formulas for carbon dioxide, carbon disulfide, sulfur dioxide, and hydrogen sulfide. He also applied his hypothesis to metals 
and assigned atomic weights to 17 metallic elements based upon the analysis. Avogadro's law, a principle stated in 1811 by the Italian chemist Amadeo Avogadro, 1776-1856, that equal volumes of gases at the same temperature and pressure contain the same number of molecules, regardless of their chemical nature and physical properties. Let me read that again, the one in yellow. Equal volumes of gases at the same temperature and pressure contain the same number of molecules. That's what that equation above means. When people think of Avogadro, they think of moles. And you could talk about moles because N is actually moles. Even though I didn't read the word mole in the law, it says the same number of molecules. Understood? The same number of molecules. Let's look at some molecules. And we see, uh, and, we, and we can read, however, his reference to gas metallic may have actually delayed chemists' acceptance of this idea. In 1821, he offered the correct formula for alcohol, C2H6O, and for ether, C4H10O. Let's look at those equations again, those chemical formulas. Let me teach you something about organic chemistry. Look at the ethyl alcohol above, and notice that H, or hydrogen, is blue, and the carbon is green, and the oxygen is white. Do you see that C2H5 to the left of the oxygen in ethyl alcohol? That's called an ethyl group. Two carbons surrounded by hydrogens in that pattern, C2H5. Look at ethyl diethyl ether. Diethyl ether has it on the left side of the oxygen and also on the right side of the oxygen. Whereas with ethyl alcohol, it's only on the left. And then you have, you have the ethyl group and then you have the OH. OH is called an alcohol group. That's what makes it an alcohol. It's a functional group. So the oxygen surrounded by two hydrocarbons makes that, a functional, that oxygen a functional group. That's the ether. That makes it an ether as opposed to an alcohol, as opposed to an alcohol. And it's Amadeo Avogadro that came up with the formulas for ethyl alcohol and diethyl ether. Now let's look at Avogadro's law. Explained by Avogadro's hypothesis, equal volumes of gases at the same temperature and pressure will contain the same number of molecules. Avogadro's law the volume of gas at a given temperature and pressure is directly proportional to the number of moles of gas. Mathematically, volume equals constant times moles. First person to some, tell me during a lunch time, what is the similarity between Avogadro's law and some of Gay-Lussac's research will get extra credit. Okay, let's continue with reading about Amadeo Avogadro. Priority over who actually introduced the molecular hypothesis of gases was disputed throughout much of the 19th century. Avogadro's claim rested primarily upon his repeated statements and applications. Others attributed this hypothesis to the French natural philosopher André-Marie Ampère, who published a similar idea in 1814. Many factors account for the fact that Avogadro's hypothesis was generally ignored until after his death. First, the distinction between atoms and molecules was not generally understood. Furthermore, as similar atoms were thought to repel one another, the existence of polyatomic elementary molecules seemed unlikely. Uh, that word polyatomic. Well, a polyatomic ion also contains molecular bonds. Here is a comparison of Gay-Lussac's experiment with Avogadro's hypothesis. Notice the similarities and notice the differences between the experiment 
and the hypothesis. Notice also that these that this body of research occurred not too terribly um, in time apart from each other. It was actually very, very similar. It was 18th, 17th, uh, 19th century that we went from Boyle to Avogadro, Charles, Gay-Lussac, and Avogadro. They were all in there somewhere. And so we have a lot of, the, a lot of our research being done within a short period of time, relatively speaking. Avogadro also mathematically represented his findings in ways more familiar to physicists than chemists. Avogadro married Felicity Mays of Biela in 1815. Why are we mentioning that? Well, together they had six children, home-loving, industrious, and modest. He rarely left Turin. His minimal contact with prominent scientists and his habit of citing his own results, increased his isolation. Although he argued in 1845 that his molecular hypothesis for determining atomic weights was widely accepted, considerable confusion still existed over the concept of atomic weights at that time. So there were, there were outside forces that helped suppress his hypothesis and the experimentation that it was based on from becoming accepted worldwide. And it had to do with something very simple and something very important, and that is he was a family man. You know, he was modest, he had six children, and he spent time with his family. So he rarely left Turin, and he interacted rarely with uh, scientists from around the world. Here we have something uh, from Avogadro's work. Notice that I'm going to increase, let's say I double the, um, the uh, or I increase dramatically the number of molecules. Look at, look at the pressure, how the pressure is increasing as I, as I go left to right, and they're, per, they're increasing proportionately. Look at the number of molecules on the left and then on the right of the plus sign and then on the right of the yield sign. Look how similar... Uh, they are relative to how they're increasing as you proceed from left to right. Avogadro's hypothesis began to gain broad appeal among chemists only after his compatriot and fellow scientist Stanislaw Canizaro demonstrated its value in 1858, two years after Avogadro's death. Many of Avogadro's pioneering ideas and methods anticipated later developments in physical chemistry. His hypothesis is now regarded as a law, and the value known as Avogadro's number, or 6.02214179 times 10 to the 23rd, the number of molecules in a gram molecule or mole of any substance has become a fundamental constant of physical science. Notice it says, two years after Avogadro's death, Canizaro demonstrated this number. Very interesting. Here's our friendly Mr. Mole uh, performing a chemical experiment. Uh, the mole, again, is an integral part of anything that we do within a chemical equation, which has the same ratios that were talked about by Avogadro and... Uh, Gay-Lussac. Here's the number, sextillion. 602 sextillion, quintillion, quadrillion, trillion, billion, millions. It's a very, very large, large, large number. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Unbelievable. Here is a, a map of sorts that helps you understand the relationships among representative particles, mass, volume, and mole. I put this on the board. I think of it as a little bit of a steering wheel, and it helps guide you through stoichiometry. Here's Thomas Graham, known for his Graham's Law. His work could not have been could not have been done if he did not know what a molecule looked like. Here's ethylene oxide. There's that ethylene, that ethyl. See the C2 
H2, there's another H on the other side. Uh, so this is ethylene oxide, okay? And um, ammonia and hydrogen on both ends, and then you make the ammonium chloride. Uh, that's another uh, separate, separate, um, separate uh, picture there. Thomas Graham, born in December, December 20th, 1805 in Glasgow, Scotland, died September 11th, 1869, London, England. British chemist often referred to as the father of colloid chemistry. Educated in Scotland, Graham persisted in becoming a chemist, though his father disapproved and withdrew his support. He then made his living by writing and teaching. He was a professor at a school in Edinburgh from 1830 to 1837 and at University College London in 1837 and 1855 and was Master of the Mint from 1855 to 1869. Don't forget he died in 1869. Let me go back to the, the drawing on the previous page for a moment. Now, I just want to show you this just for a moment. Do you see that this is actually two different illustrations? The top illustration is a ball and stick model of ethylene oxide. Ignore that part for a moment. And the bottom is what I want you to look at. You see you have ammonia, which is a gas on the bottom. It's 17 grams per mole. That's its, uh, its weight, its molecular weight and per mole. And then um, you have uh, hydro hydrochloric acid, hydrogen chloride gas, actually, not hydrochloric acid. And they're going to diffuse or effuse, and they're going to they're going to travel, they're going to travel in the tube, and they're going to meet in the middle, and they're going to form ammonium chloride. Now, how fast are they going? Well, this is the equation which shows you how to relate the rate of effusion diffusion, which is there are two different terms uh, of uh, a and B, or of ammonia and hydrochlor hydrogen chloride, and then the relationship between the rate and the mole. So here it is again, just look at the bottom one, where it has NH3 and HCl traveling in a tube, 100 centimeters, etc., one meter. Okay, I just wanted to show you that. Now, let's talk about Thomas, continue to talk about Thomas Graham and Graham's Law and a little bit about the man himself relative to the diffusion or effusion of gases. Graham's first important paper dealt with the diffusion of gases, 1829. He developed Graham's law of the diffusion rate of gases and also found that the relative rates of the effusion of gases are comparable to the diffusion rates. From examining the diffusion of one liquid into another, he divided particles into two classes. Crystalloids, such as common salt having high diffusibility, and colloids, such as gum arabic, having low diffusibility. He devised dialysis, a method from, for separating colloids from crystalloids, and also proved that the process of liquid diffusion causes partial decomposition of certain chemical compounds. He invented many of the terms used in colloid chemistry today. Here is, uh, here is uh, the difference between effusion and uh, diffusion. Effusion is through a hole, uh, and diffusion is when you... I'm going to take up that partition and the gases are going to diffuse throughout the container. In 1833, Graham studied the three forms of phosphoric acid, and from this work, the concept of polybasic acids developed. In 1835, he, he reported on the properties of the water of crystallization in hyd hydrated salts, he also obtained definite compounds of salts and alcohol, the alkylates, analogs of the hydrates. In his final paper, he described palladium hydride, 
the first known instance of a solid compound formed from a metal and a gas. Uh, copper to sulfate pentahydrate is a very common and, and much studied hydrate. Copper to sulfate pentahydrate. Uh, <clears throat> here is another picture of effusion. Effusion is the diffusion of gas from a container where you have a high concentration to the outside. It's a small opening to the outside uh, where you have uh, it, it going through a hole. Here's another, here's another uh, of Graham's law of diffusion where V is the velocity of molecules and M is the molecular mass of the molecules. And that's the law that relates them mathematically. That's the law that, re that relates them mathematically. It's called Graham's Law of Diffusion. Here is the, the fraction of the molecules on the y-axis, the molecular speed on the x-axis. You can see that the heavier something is, the more difficult it is going to be to uh, diffuse. Look at helium is, is very fast, etc. Now let's talk about Jonas van der Waals. Uh, van der Waals forces. These are these are intermolecular forces that help give uh, liquids a kind of uh, strange, strange uh, attractions. These are dipole ion dipole forces, where um, these are like hydrogen bonding, and uh, but this is particularly water uh, surrounding uh, salt salt ions. Jonas Diedrich van der Waals, born November 23, 1837, Leiden, Netherlands, died March 9, 1923, in Amsterdam. Dutch physicist, winner of the 1910 Nobel Prize for Physics for his research on the gaseous and liquid states of matter. He, his work made the study of temperatures near absolute zero possible. A self-educated man who took advantage of the opportunities offered by the University of Leiden. Van der Waals first attracted notice in 18, no pun intended, in 1873 with his doctoral treatise on the continuity of the liquid and gaseous state for which he was awarded a doctorate. In pursuing his research, he knew that the ideal gas law could be derived from the kinetic theory of gases if it could be assumed that gas molecules have zero volume and that there are no attractive forces between them. Notice again, here we are in the, the 19th century, yes, going into the 20th century, but it's still within a few hundred years of Boyle's research. Here is a single water molecule uh, with strong covalent bonds. Now, because you have the oxygen, the red, uh, you have, and you have a, something sets up where you have this um, asymmetric geometry, and you form these these forces, uh, these attractions, as as was indicated on the right side. Taking into account that neither assumption is true, in 1881 he introduced into law two parameters representing size and attraction, and worked out a more exact formula known as the van der Waals equation. Since the parameters were distinct for each gas, he continued his work and arrived at an equation, the law of corresponding states, that is the same for all substances. It was his work that brought him the Nobel Prize and also led Sir James Dewar of England and Heike Kamerling Onus of the Netherlands to the determination of the necessary data for the liquefaction of hydrogen and helium. Interesting. Van der Waals was appointed professor of physics at the University of Amsterdam in 1877, a post he retained until 1907. Here is um, a polar covalent bonds. This is hydrogen chloride. You have this, you have a partial negative charge and a partial positive charge. Partial negative on the left, partial positive on the right. And you have this dipole attraction, this physical attraction between the two. The van der Waals forces, weak attractive forces between atoms or molecules, were named in his honor. 
Van der Waals bonding. Water molecules in liquid water are attracted to each other by electrostatic forces, and these forces have been described as Van der Waals forces or Van der Waals bonds. Even though the water molecule as a whole is essentially neutral, the distribution of charge in the molecule is not symmetrical because of its geometry and leads to a dipole moment, a, a microscopic separation of the positive and negative charge centers. This leads to a net attraction between such polar molecules which finds expression in the cohesion of water molecules and contributes to viscosity and surface tension. It's called hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. And here's an example of hydrogen bonding. That kind of squiggly little sign is a Greek letter and it says partial negative charge by the oxygen, partial positive charge by the hydrogen, and the dotted lines are physical bonds. They're the Van der Waals bonds. We know that hydrogen and oxygen are covalent bonds. I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Perhaps it is fair to say that Van der Waals forces are what holds water in the liquid state until thermal agitation becomes violent enough to break those Van der Waal bonds at 100 degrees Celsius. With cooling, residual electrostatic forces between molecules cause most substances to liquefy and eventually solidify, with the exception of helium, which never becomes a solid at atmospheric pressure. Even nonpolar molecules experience some Van der Waals bonding, which can be attributed to their being polarizable. Now, with that said, water does not conduct electricity. Pure H2O, even though it has polarity, does not conduct electricity. Period. It is what is dissolved in water that can produce, that can conduct electricity. But look at those water molecules, all these little positive and negative charges. They're called partial positive and negative charges. Water does not conduct electricity. Fascinating though how electrostatic forces can give water some of its more peculiar properties. Even though the molecules don't have permanent dipole moments, they can have instantaneous dipole moments which change or oscillate them with time. These fluctuations of molecular dipole moments lead to a net attraction between molecules which allow nonpolar substances like carbon tetrachloride to form liquids. Examination of the dipole electric field shows that the electric field from one instantaneous dipole will tend to polarize a neighboring molecule such that it will be attracted. Sort of the electrical analog to a bar magnet magnetizing a paper, cl paper clip so that it will be attracted to the magnet. This happens regardless of which pole of the magnet is brought close to the paper clip. Also, here's again, before I continue, here's another thing we call, uh, uh, this is hydrocarbons, and you're going to have points of repulsion and attraction. Van der Waals attraction, you'll have the repulsions that set up and these are Van der Waals forces. You have a cation as positive charge, etc. Let's take, let's continue to look at this drawing for just a moment. <clears throat> Again, here we have repulsion and attraction, and we have what a cation is, and we have this lining up of these charges. They're not chemical bonds, but they are physical in nature, and these lining up of charges kind of help to tuck one molecule into another, provided the geometry is conducive. For instance, one of the reasons water has these little, these little dipoles is because of its geometry, its bent or angular geometry. Its asymmetry allows this dipole to form, as we looked at, with covalent bonding. The weaker Van der Waal forces in nonpolar liquids may be manifested in low surface tension and low boiling points. Let's look at that one uh, again.
Let's read that again. The weaker Van der Waals forces in nonpolar liquids may be manifested in low surface tension and low boiling points. Uh, this is going to be very important uh, when it comes to the study of bonding uh, at a higher level in a higher uh, science course. We're going to come back and look at that uh, once more after, um, after a moment. Here we have another illustration where we see that there's a lining up of the partial positive with the partial negative and you're creating, you're going to create a matrix of, of charges and you may manipulate the state the matter is in. Let's look at this just one more time. This differentiates between the strong intramolecular within the molecule called covalent bonding, that's in the upper left of the drawing, and then the weaker, the weak intermolecular uh, between the molecules. Those are the Van der Waals dipole-dipole and contact uh, attractions. So now what we want to do is we want to look at John Dalton. He's the last scientist that we're going to look at in the development of the theories that support gas laws. Okay, here's John Dalton. He's known for Dalton's Law, and he was a, a British scientist, and here is something that could be considered part of his uh, research. This, this is part of Dalton's law of partial pressure. The pressure of the hydrogen plus the pressure of the helium is going to equal the total pressure. So each gas can be added and looked at individually. Dalton's law, the statement that total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the individual component gases. The partial pressure is the pressure that each gas would exert if it alone occupied the volume of the mixture at the same temperature. The empirical relationship was stated by the French chemist John Dalton in 1801. It followed from the kinetic theory of gases under the assumption of a perfect ideal gas and assumes no chemical interaction between the component gases. It is approximately valid for real gases at sufficiently low pressures and high pressures. Let me take a break. You'll never know I was gone. Here is an illustration consistent with much of what Dalton agreed with and developed himself rather, relative to molecular theory of gases, and that is that uh, when molecules collide, they undergo elastic collisions. They, they rebound in straight lines, and uh, as a result, they can diffuse. Early life and career. British chemist John Dalton was born in Eaglesfield, England, on September 7, 1766, to a Quaker family. He had two surviving siblings. Both he and his brother were born colorblind. Dalton's father earned a modest income as a handloom weaver. As a child, Dalton longed for a formal education, but his family was very poor. It was clear that he would need to help out with the family finances from a young age. John Dalton uh, <clears throat> was also born in that period of time when you had, a, you had an explosion of uh, theories and experimentation, the new philosophy, uh, experimentation over argument, and um, here's, a, here's an example of uh, Newton's partial law of partial pressures. Here are the individual pressures that make up air. Now if you add them up, then you'll get 101.3 as the pressure of air. Uh, oxygen is about 20.9, etc. Uh, similar to its percent of air. After attending a Quaker school in the village of in the in his village in Cumberland, when Dalton was just 12 years old, he started teaching there. When he was 14, he spent a year working as a farmhand, but decided to return to teaching, this time as an assistant at a Quaker boarding school in Kendall. Within four years, the shy young man was made principal of the school. 
He remained there until 1793, at which time he became a math and philosophy tutor at the New College in Manchester, which is in the Midlands, sort of, uh, in west of the Midlands in uh, Britain and UK. So you can see that he did not start out as a scientist. He started out in education. He was a teacher. He uh, had to earn money, etc. Here are uh, two gases. And the uh, partial pressure of gas A plus gas B, and when you put them together, they will equal the total gas of gas A and gas B, the total pressure. So, uh, also, while at New College, John Dalton joined the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society. Membership granted Dalton access to the laboratory facilities. For one of his first research projects, Dalton pursued his avid interest in meteorology. He started keeping daily logs of the weather, paying special attention to details such as wind velocity and barometric pressure, a habit Dalton would continue all of his life. His research findings on atmospheric pressure were published in his first book, Meteorological Findings, the Year He Arrived in Manchester. So you can see that his career is beginning to build from a fledgling teacher to someone who is understanding the concept of experimentation and data. You can see that he's working with atmospheric pressure. Here is a, a picture that is demonstrating when uh, the molecules that make up water are, are, are bent molecules. They, they're moving and they're going to create vapor pressure when they evaporate and those particles are uh, contributing to the overall partial pressure of the air above the water. During his early career as a scientist, Dalton also researched color blindness, a topic in which he was familiar though first -hand, through first-hand experience. Since the condition had affected both he and his brother since birth, Dalton theorized that it must be hereditary. He proved his theory to be true when genetic analysis of his own eye tissue revealed that he was missing the photoreceptor for perceiving the color green. As a result of his con contributions to the understanding of red-green color blindness, the condition is often referred to as Daltonism. Daltonism. Red-green color blindness. Uh, difficult to perceive the color green. He was missing the photoreceptor for perceiving the color green. Here is another uh, example uh, which is consistent with the scientists from that time. The difference between carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Uh, it's a difference in the number of oxygen atoms bound to the carbon. Dalton's interest in atmospheric pressure pressures eventually led him to a closer examination of gases. While studying the nature and chemical makeup of air in the early 1800s, Dalton learned that it was not a chemical solvent as other scientists had believed. Instead, it was a mechanical system composed of small individual particles that used pressure applied by each gas independently. Very interesting. Dalton learned that it was not a chemical solvent. While studying the nature and chemical makeup of air, scientists in the 1800s, Dalton learned that it was not a chemical solvent. Very interesting. So you can see that he's slowly progressing towards the, the, uh, the great scientist that we've known him to be in our chemistry books. Dissolved gas, uh, dynamic equilibrium, uh, B is the partial pressure of the gas increased, and then you have dynamic equilibrium. So, um, so the equilibrium that exists as a change of volume. Dalton's experiments on gases led to his discovery that the total pressure of a mixture of gases 
amounted to the sum of the partial pressures that each individual gas exerted while occupying the same space. In 1803, this scientific principle officially came to be known as Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. Dalton's Law primarily applies to ideal gases rather than real gases due to the elasticity and low particle volume of molecules in ideal gases. Chemist Humphrey Davy was skeptical about Dalton's law until Dalton explained that the repelling forces previously believed to create pressure only acted between atoms of the same sort and that the atoms within a mixture that the atoms within a mixture varied in weight and complexity. That's with chemist Humphrey Davy. Here is a illustration that shows that when I increase the pressure of a gas, I will increase the solubility of that gas if the gas is above a liquid. So I have initial equilibrium, add pressure, etc. The principle of Dalton's law can be demonstrated using a simple experiment involving a glass bottle and large bowl of water. When the bottle is submerged under water, the water it contains is displaced, but the bottle isn't empty. It's filled with the invisible gas hydrogen instead. The amount of pressure exerted by the hydrogen can be identified using a chart that lists the pressure of water vapors at different temperatures. Also, thanks to Dalton's discoveries, the knowledge has many useful principal practical applications today. For instance, scuba divers use Dalton's principles to gauge how pressure levels at different depths of the ocean will affect the air and nitrogen in their tanks. I will do another lecture that talks about uh, pressure in a scuba tank. During the early 1800s, Dalton also postulated a law of thermal expansion that illustrated the heating and cooling reaction of gases to expansion and compression. He garnered international fame for his additional study using a crudely fashioned dew point hygrometer to determine how temperature impacts the level of atmospheric water vapor. Dalton's fascination with gases gradually led him to formally assert that every form of matter, whether solid, liquid, or gas, was made up of small individual particles. He referred to the Greek philosopher Democritus of Abdera's more abstract theory of matter, which had centuries ago fallen out of fashion, and borrowed the term atomos, or atoms, to label the particles. It, in an article he wrote for the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society in 1803, Dalton created the first chart of atomic weights. When you first study chemistry, you're studying atomic weights, you're studying the periodic table, etc. And that's where John Dalton's name first, or first is seen. And it's after a lot of study um, uh, on atomic theory that you see his name in gases later in the year. And here is an example that, that matter is, is discrete and made of particles, and those particles are made of atoms. Seeking to expand on his theory, he redressed, readdressed the subject of atomic weight in his book, A New System of Chemical Philosophy, published in 1808. In a new system of chemical philosophy, Dalton introduced his belief, his, his belief that atoms of different elements could be universally distinguished based on their varying atomic weights. In so doing, he became the first scientist to explain the behavior of atoms in terms of the measurement of weight. 
he also uncovered the fact that atoms couldn't be created or destroyed. So it was upon this work. So would John Dalton, if John Dalton didn't do his work, could Mendeleev have done his work? Now you know that Mendeleev organized his table according to atomic weights. And it was later found that we organize it uh, according to atomic number. Uh, here's another example uh, consistent with uh, Dalton, and that is that uh, matter is made of particles. And these particles, when they collide, if it's in an ideal gas, undergo elastic collisions. But if it wasn't for his work, could these future uh, chemists have done their work? Dalton's theory additionally examined the compositions of compounds, explaining that the tiny particles, atoms, in a compound were compound atoms. Twenty years later, chemist Amadeo Avogadro would further detail the difference between atoms and compound atoms. In a new system of chemical philosophy, Dalton also wrote about his experiments proving that atoms consistently combine in simple ratios. What that meant was that the molecules of an element are always made up of the same proportions with the exception of water molecules. Let me read that again. What that meant was that molecules of an element are always made up of the same proportions with the exception of water molecules. Absolutely fascinating. Let's take a break. Here you can see that as I, as I decrease the volume, I am increasing the pressure. The molecules will be moving relatively the same speed if, it's the, if the temperature is constant. And this pressure is obviously caused by these, these particle-like structures we know now know as atoms and molecules. In 1810, Dalton published an appendix to a new system of chemical philosophy. In it, he elaborated on some of the practical details of his theory, that the atoms within a given element are all exactly the same size and weight, while the atoms of different elements look and are different from one another. Dalton eventually composed a table listing the atomic weights of all known elements very, very much a precursor to Mendeleev's work. And I would say uh, very important relative to Mendeleev's early work. And could Mendeleev's work have been done at all if it wasn't the work done by Dalton prior to uh, Mendeleev's work? So uh, the scientists certainly did work together. Uh, here's something else that might uh, be consistent with the... Um, with uh, Avogadro and Dalton, and that is, look, uh, there's three types of combinations of nitrogen and oxygen, NO, NO2, and N2O. Nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and dinitrogen monoxide. His atomic theories were quickly adopted by the scientific community at large with few objections. Dalton made atoms scientifically useful, asserted uh, Williamson Jones, a science historian at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, Nobel laureate Sir, Sir Harry Croteau, noted for co-discovering spherical carbon fullerenes, identified the revolutionary impact of Dalton's discovery on the field of chemistry. The crucial step was to write down elements in terms of their atoms. I don't know how they could do chemistry beforehand. It didn't make any sense. Absolutely positively remarkable. And here is a, a person who at the age of 12 was a teacher. At the age of uh, eight, 18 or 19 was the principal of a school. Here is uh, another distribution of uh, relative to the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of the velocity of water at various temperatures. Uh, so speed is on the x-axis, and the probability is on the y-axis. Later life. From 1817 to the day he died, Dalton served as president of the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society, the organization that first granted him access to a laboratory. 
the practitioner of Quaker modesty. He resisted public recognition. In 1822, he turned down elected membership to the Royal Society. In 1832, he did, however, begrudgingly accept an honorary doctorate of science degree from the prestigious Oxford University. Ironically, his graduation gown was red, a color he could not see. John Dalton. Here is an illustration that looks at a very small quadrant of uh, gases that are being heated, uh, which is consistent with what Duton, Dalton and the other uh, scientists looked at and discussed in their theories on gases. Fortunately for him, his colorblindness was a convenient excuse for him to override the Quaker rule forbidding its subscribers to wear red. In 1833, the government granted him a pension, which was doubled in 1836. Dalton was offered another degree, this time a doctorate of law by Edinburgh University in 1834, as if those honors were insufficient tribute to the revolutionary chemist in London, a statue was erected in Dalton's honor, also in 1834. Dalton was very much an icon for Manchester, said William jo Williams Jones. He is probably the only scientist who got a statue in his lifetime, before he died, in his lifetime. Unbelievable. John Dalton. Here is um, just another illustration of the particle theory, the kinetic theory, the particle theory of, uh, of matter, that uh, matter is made of atoms. Atoms, are, atoms compose uh, uh, compounds, uh, molecules in constant ratios. In his later life, Dalton continued to teach and lecture at universities throughout the United Kingdom. Although it is said that the scientist was an awkward lecturer with a gruff and jarring voice, throughout his lifetime, Dalton managed to maintain his nearly impeccable reputation as a devout Quaker. He lived in a humble, uncomplicated life. He lived a humble, uncomplicated life, fo focusing on his fascination with science and never married. In 1837, Dalton had a stroke. He had trouble with his speech for the next year. Here's another illustration that continues to look at the um, ratios of nitrogen and oxygen and how they, how they can combine to form nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, dinitrogen oxide, dinitrogen, di dinitrogen dioxide, and dinitrogen pentoxide, all in various ratios. After suffering a second stroke, Dalton died quietly on the evening of July 26, 1844, at his home in Manchester, England. He was provided a civic funeral and granted full honors. A reported 40,000 people attended the procession, honoring his contributions to science, manufacturing, and the nation's commerce. By finding a way to weigh atoms, John Dalton's research not only changed the face of chemistry, but also initiated its progression into modern science. The splitting of the atom in the 20th century could most likely not have been accomplished without Dalton laying the foundation of knowledge about the atomic makeup of simple and complex molecules. Dalton's discoveries also allowed for the cost-efficient manufacturing of chemical compounds, since they essentially give manufacturers a recipe for determining the correct chemical proportions in a given compound. So that was the reference to commerce and manufacturing. Unbelievable. John Dalton. John Dalton's Atomic Theory all matter is composed of small particles called atoms. All atoms of a given element are like. Compounds are formed when different atoms combine in fix, fixed proportions. A chemical reaction involves the rearrangement of atoms. 
The majority of conclusions that made up Dalton's atomic theory still stand today. Now with nanotechnology, atoms are the centerpiece, said Nottingham University professor of chemistry David Garner. Atoms are manipulated directly to make new medicines, semiconductors, and plastics. He went on to further explain. He gave us the first understanding of the nature of materials. Now we can design molecules with a pretty good idea of their properties. In 2003, on the bicentennial of Dalton's public announcement of his atomic theory, the Manchester Museum held a tribute to the man, his life, and his groundbreaking scientific discoveries. And here are some sources that were used in formulating this lecture.